Friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander what they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Good evening. Good to be here with you all this evening to worship God. I'm glad that you could make it out this evening and, and join us. Uh, I appreciate Vance on that reading. I was wondering if I could borrow your voice there, man. That's, that was good. I like that. That was, that was awesome. Um, and he was talking to me, too, before he said, you know, you're, I'm reading about a third of the book here. You know, I'm reading one third of a book. And I said, well, I thought about having you just read the whole thing. So, <laughs> But I figured I'd spare you all from that. <clears throat> The book of Jude, in the book of Jude, rather, <clears throat> Jude writes to Christians, telling them to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to them, in verse 3. Jude then explains why he was urged to do so. As he says, there were some who had snuck in among them and were perverting the grace of Christ and denying Jesus Christ altogether, in verse 4. And so you see, the thrust of this epistle deals with this problem. And what Jude does for us, in verse 11 in particular, is what we're going to be focusing on. Is he gives us three illustrations. He gives us three men. And by doing so, he breaks down for us the character of these people that had infiltrated their church. So over the next three lessons... I want to look at these three examples that Jude gives. So this is going to be kind of the beginning of a series um, that we'll look at over the next three weeks, uh, starting tonight. And we'll look at these three examples that Jude gives and see what we can glean from them. Now, I want to be clear, this isn't necessarily due to the fact that I'm worried about a bunch of false teachers or, or anything like that uh, in our fellowship as of right now. That's not something that I'm, that I'm concerned about. I feel we have a sound and, and solid grip on Scripture here. But what I'm interested in and, and worried about more so is the base characteristics of those that Jude warns us about and whether or not I have anything in common with them or whether or not we have anything in common with them and see what we can learn by these examples that Jude gives us. After all, those who were perverting the gospel and denying Christ and blaspheming that which they do not know and frustrating the faith of some at this time, they likely didn't start off this way. Perhaps they had some bad habits or some poor attitudes or were susceptible to listening to some, some poor teaching, and that eventually led them to become what they became, and that's enemies of the gospel of Christ. So Jude gives us these three men as an example. In verse 11 of Jude, he says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion. And each of these men serve as a lesson as to what not to do. 
show of hands, how many people here are the youngest siblings in, the, in their family? Okay, all right. I could have just as easily asked who's the favorite of their family, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, those of us who are younger or youngest siblings, rather, we had an advantage growing up, didn't we? And that's that we got to learn, quote, the easy way. We got to watch our older siblings make mistakes, and then we got to learn from their mistakes. And, you know, I remember one particular instance. My brother was younger, too, so we can laugh about it. <laughs> but uh, I remember my brother told my dad that uh, he did not like to be told what to do. And uh, I learned a very valuable lesson that you don't tell dad that you don't like to be told what to do. I learned that the easy way. My brother learned it the hard way. <laughs> and that's the advantage of being a youngest sibling. You, you learn what not to do when your brothers make mistakes. But we who are Bible students, we who are Christians, we're in a similar position today. I mean, as you open up your Bible, there are hundreds of examples. There are hundreds of individuals that are put forth in our Bibles and we have so many good examples in the Bible, so many good examples of faith and righteousness. But on the flip side, there's also a lot of bad examples. In other words, examples that we can learn from. And that's what we have in these three men, in the, in the men of, of Cain and, and Balaam and Korah. And so tonight, what I want to focus on as we're kicking off this, this little series here is I just want to talk about what it means to be walking in the way of Cain. And so I just want to take a look at, at Cain's life or what we know about him rather and, and just dissect and, and figure out what we can learn from this and, and figure out uh, how we can learn the easy way through Cain. And the first thing that we learn through Cain as far as what not to do is reluctant worship. We must not be reluctant in our worship towards God. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 4, you do well to mark your Bibles in Genesis chapter 4 because we'll be flipping back and forth uh, throughout the evening here. But what we find with Cain immediately is that Cain could have done better. He could have done better, couldn't he have? Genesis chapter 4, and in verse 2, we find that Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. We see Cain could have done better, because what do we see that Cain offered? It says that he simply offered some fruit of the ground. But where we see that Cain could have done better is by what we learn about Abel. When we get to Abel, it says that he brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. We don't see that, that Cain brought the first fruits or the best fruits, but he just brought some fruit of the ground. And so I conclude from that that Cain could have done better. And so what held Cain back? What kept him from offering his best to God? The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 11 in verse 4, it tells us the difference between Cain and Abel, as you all are familiar with going through the Hebrew class right now on Sunday mornings. The fundamental difference was faith. This was a faith issue on Cain's side. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. It says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. We look at that and we see clearly it was, Cain, it was Abel's faith. His faith in God is what led him to offer his very best to God. And so we conclude that Cain was in some way lacking faith to do the same. And so I understand we have to be a little bit, or rather understand that we have to be a little bit conjectural as we don't have every little detail about what goes on here. But as I'm studying this, it seems to me that Cain was almost holding the fruit of the ground, what he has gained from the ground. It seems like he's holding some of it for ransom from God, right? He's not going to offer more to God than, without knowing that there's going to be some left over for him. The thought of that makes him uncomfortable. And you know, there's been times in my life where I've done the same thing. How many of us do the same thing in our own lives? where we're hesitant, we're reluctant to offer our very best to God until he shows us that he can give us something worthy of our efforts. 
Abel wasn't waiting for that. He just, the faith was already there. And so he offered his best. Cain didn't have that kind of faith. And this is why Cain was reluctant to give more. It made him uncomfortable to offer the best, of, the best fruits of his ground because he didn't have faith that God would continue to take care of him and have the crops continue to yield fruit. He didn't have the faith. Another thing I want to suggest and throw out there that, I, again, I understand is conjectural. Perhaps one of the reasons Cain didn't offer his best was because he thought God wouldn't notice or care if he didn't offer his best. That's something for us to think about today. How many of us are reluctant to offer our best towards God in worship or just in our daily life with God? Because we think, well, God's not going to notice or God's not going to care. We see that that's perhaps a mistake that Cain made. And what we see is that God in reality cared very much about whether or not Cain offered his best, didn't he? And so I want to ask a question. What are we offering? What are we offering? What are we offering as a church? And you know, I can make the application. We can make, we can make the, the literal money application, right? What are we offering as a church? You know, just this morning, if you weren't here, there was a wonderful announcement made. We, we paid off the building here at Los Osos Church of Christ. What an amazing thing that that is. But I know the elders don't want us to think for a second that this is an opportunity for us to offer less now. We, we can't be looking at it as an opportunity to do that. We need to be looking at this instead as an opportunity to do even more when it comes to spreading God's word and evangelizing and supporting preachers. There's some congregations that support up to 20 preachers. That's something for us to aim for. That's something to be motivated by. And that's something we have an even greater opportunity to do now. But not just in what we're offering as far as money goes. But what about just every day? What are we offering as a church in our community, in our conduct, in the example that we set? Are we offering our very best as we aim to serve God? As I think about that, I think about the church in Thessalonica, and I think of them, and it seems to me that they just offered their very best, that they were giving their very best effort towards God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and starting in verse 6, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What are we offering as a church? Are we in our community setting an example for what it means to be a good, solid, New Testament church? Are we an example to other believers as well? We need to be offering our best, not just in terms of money, but in our conduct and in our faith. What are we offering as individuals? As individuals that make up the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and in verse 1, we know that it says there, as Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know, for... In Abel's case, he offered the very best of his flock as a sacrifice to God. And for us today, we need to make sure that we're offering the very best of ourselves as a sacrifice to God. Because what we find with congregations that do that, where everybody is offering the very best of themselves, when they're fully dedicated to God, when they're dedicated to being a living sacrifice to God, 
We see that the strongest churches are seen when every individual does their part and does that. And that's what's laid out for us here in Romans chapter 12. And as you drop down to verse 4, Paul says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are one, one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Then he goes on and he lists several different gifts, prophesying and and service and teaching and exhortations and contributions and leading and acts of mercy. We all have a gift, but what does Paul say? He says, let us use them. It's one thing to see your gift, to know your gift, but what good does it do if we're not using them? If we're not contributing to the body of Christ, if we're not doing our best to use our gifts to further the growth of this congregation. So I want to ask, can we do better? And we know that the proper attitude and the answer is always yes. I get that. But that shouldn't be for a lack of effort. The aim should always be to offer our very best in every area of our discipleship. There cannot be and must not be any reluctance in our service and worship to God individually and as an entire body. Otherwise, perhaps God will look at what we offer either as a congregation or maybe as individuals, and maybe he'll look at what we're offering in our daily lives, and he'll look at it the same way that he looked at Cain's offering, without regard. We can do better. That's not where we want to be. And so we must learn from Cain not to be reluctant in our worship. But what we also learn from Cain is not to be coveting our brothers. And as you look at Cain's life and the story of Cain, I understand that the word coveting there isn't used. But if you really boil it down, this is what seems to be at the core of Cain's problems. Right? In Genesis chapter 4, in verses 4 and 5, we see that God the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but he did not regard Cain's offering. And what did, how did Cain respond to that? It says he became angry. And why was, he, why was he angry? He was angry because Abel simply did better than Cain. He looked at the honor that Abel had received, and he began to covet that. He was jealous of that. And this jealousy and anger manifested itself in the absolute worst way, the murder of his brother. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. John writes, we should not be like Cain, right? This is what not to do. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. He murdered his brother because he did better than him. But you know what's really interesting about that? Is that Cain had this issue, he was angry and he was jealous And he was mad at Abel, despite the fact, even though the fault was his own. Cain was the only one to blame. What does God say to him in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 6? He says, the Lord, it says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You know, the solution for Cain's failures and his subsequent disappointment in himself was simple. It was simple. Do better. He says, if you do well, you'll be accepted. But instead, it appears he felt that his problems were caused by another, his brother Abel, simply because his brother did what was right. And you know, I know in my own life, I have faulted others for my own mistakes. Many of us have done that. And it's so easy to shift the blame to another instead of taking responsibility. 
even though it's so much easier. We see in the life of Cain that it would have been so much easier if he just would have taken responsibility for his actions and learned to just work harder and do better. He could have done that. But sometimes it seems that pride gets in the way. Pride gets in the way of us doing this. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And in Proverbs 18, 12, it says, Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. You know what I take away from this? When pride has consumed us, we can find fault with anyone, can't we? It's so easy to do that. When pride has consumed us, we can find fault with anyone, even when the person has done everything right. Cain had a problem. It was coveting, it was jealousy, it was anger. But his pride kept him from admitting his wrongs and fixing them. And we see that, no wonder, the wise man says, destruction, uh, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty. But he also offers a cure in that same verse of Proverbs 18, 12. He says, humility comes before honor. Humility was the only cure for Cain's sickness of rage and jealousy. But we see, instead of that, he allowed jealousy and coveting to consume him completely. And we see that it ultimately led to him murdering his brother. And maybe that's not where coveting will lead us. Maybe that's not where jealousy and anger will always lead us. I understand that's an extreme example. And so I do want to ask, where will coveting lead us? Where can it lead us? In Joshua chapter 7, we're coming to a chapter here in Joshua chapter 7 where they had just defeated Jericho. And then they go out, and they go out to battle against Ai, and they lose against Ai. It's a battle they should have won, but they, but they are defeated by Ai. And they conclude that this is because there's sin in Israel. And we finally figure out, and we read, that it's Achan who is guilty of this sin. And the sin that he's guilty of is, well, when they went to defeat Jericho, God commanded them not to take any of the spoil. It was a direct command from God not to do that. But we see that Achan went against that command, and he did just that. And it brought trouble to Israel. And in verse 21, what does Achan say? He says, you know, I saw this cloak from Shinar, and I saw 200 shekels of silver. saw a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. And what does he say? He says, I coveted them. I coveted them and took them. And then we drop down to verse 25, and Joshua says, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And this, we see that uh, he ends up being stoned along with the rest of his family. And so I ask again, where will coveting lead us? And it seems very simple to me that the answer is that coveting will always lead us to trouble. That's what Joshua says. He says, why did you bring trouble on us? It stems back to the fact that Achan had a coveting problem. Whether we're coveting an item or whether we're coveting an individual, the success that they have, the material gains, the honor they've received, coveting's a problem and it will always lead to trouble. Trouble for us and trouble for others. And it's something that we must avoid. And we also see where coveting will not lead us. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 5, when Paul writes, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If we have a coveting problem, and it's, it's not going to lead us to heaven. In fact, he says we'll have no inheritance. And so we see for Cain, his covetousness led to complete disregard for anyone but himself, and a willingness to do whatever it takes to satisfy his desires. That's where coveting will lead us. And so we learn from Cain not to be reluctant in worship, not to covet. And finally, we learn 
that we must not ignore sound wisdom and warnings when it's presented or given to us. What will we find with Cain back in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7? What we find there is that Cain was counseled by God. It says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. God tells him what he needs to do. He counsels him. He tells him where his actions are going to lead him. He says sin is crouching at the door. And it's contrary to you. You know, here we're talking about ignoring sound wisdom and warnings. And what we see with Cain is that he was counseled by God and warned by God. But what did he do with it? He ignored it. It just goes to show that we are capable of ignoring wisdom no matter where it comes from, even when it comes from God himself. So what does Solomon or the wise man write in Proverbs chapter 15 and in verse 31 and 32 concerning the man who ignores instruction in this case? You have Cain here who is receiving instruction. He's receiving wise counsel from God. What does it say about the man who who ignores that? And we'll start in verse 31. It says, The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The only person we are hurting when we ignore wisdom and warnings, or rather I should say the person we hurt most when we ignore wisdom and warnings, because we can hurt a lot of people when we do this, but the person we hurt most is ourselves. That's what the wise man says. He says, whoever ignores instruction despises himself. And yet, when we are offered advice, when we're offered counseling, it's so easy just to be mad at an individual, to despise what the individual is saying. Who are you to tell me? The person we're hurting the most is ourselves. We certainly see, again, that this was the case with Cain because he received counseling from God, sound warning, sound wisdom, and he received it when he needed it the most. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 13, we're given a principle there. Number one, a couple principles. Number one, God's not going to tempt us beyond what we can handle. But number two, the way of escape will always be provided for us. God's not going to put us in a situation that we're not able to get out of, right, without his help. But why is it that it seems when we need to hear wisdom the most, when we need that way of escape the most, why is it that it seems that that's the time where we don't want it, when we want it the least, when we're not interested? I'm dealing with a problem right now. The last thing I want to hear, you know, leave the Bible out of this. My, my, my grandpa used to tell a story when somebody told him, leave the old book out of it. That can't be a habit for us. We see Cain was caught up in the heat of, the, of his emotions, wasn't he? And he was fortunate enough to have God talk sense into him. So here God comes and he's telling him what he needs to do. He's giving him wisdom. He's showing him the way of escape. If you do well, you'll be accepted. Sin is crouching at the door. Rule over it. Evidently, Cain did not want to hear what God had to say, as he did not implement or take to heart what the Lord said to him. So it's one thing to recognize the way of escape, isn't it? It's one thing to to listen to somebody give you wise advice, to know what the wise thing to do is. But it's another thing to actually do it, to actually act on it, to actually let it affect your heart and to change you. It seems the solutions to our problems sometimes are so simple, but that doesn't mean that they're easy. It doesn't mean that they're easy to, to integrate into our lives, does it? 
it takes diligence and it takes a reliance on God to do that. And so I do have another question. What will we do with the wisdom of God? And what will we do with the way of escape that he provides for us? James chapter 1 and verse 5 says that if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. We have this opportunity of wisdom from God to receive wisdom through his word, through prayer, through another individual who's wiser than us. We have chances of escape when we're faced with a problem. But are we going to integrate it into our lives? Or are we going to do as Cain did and ignore it and proceed to operate according to our instincts, letting our emotions dictate our actions? That's what Cain did. And if that's what we're thinking about doing, then we have to understand also where it leads. We owe ourselves that much. So where does it lead? If we're reluctant in our worship, if we allow coveting to become a problem and act on our emotions and we ignore wisdom and warnings, where does it lead? And I believe that this is what Jude is really getting at. As he says, woe to them in Jude 11, who walked in the way of Cain. He's saying this to people who understood where Cain's actions led him, where where Balaam's actions led him, where Korah's actions led him. Woe to them. So where did it lead for Cain? Genesis chapter 4, we're going back to that chapter. And we'll pick up in verse 12 of Genesis chapter 4. Here you have God, and he's talking to Cain, and and God has... uh, He's confronting Cain about the fact that he just murdered his brother Abel. And so God is, uh, is telling him what his punishment is going to be. He says in verse 12, When you work the ground, it shall, no, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. What we see right off the bat where Cain's actions have led him is a directionless life. That's where it leads. A directionless life. The Hebrew word for wander can also mean to be aimless. It leads to aimlessness when we're walking in the way of Cain. This is where acting off of our emotions will get us. When we are living a life that is dictated by our passions, that sees us making decisions in the heat of the moment, when we don't consider God and value his wisdom and warnings that he offers us in his Bible or through counseling, then we are truly without direction. We are aimless and without an anchor as well. Because we see a directionless life also means that we do not have God. If you have God in your life, you cannot say you're without direction. You're headed towards eternity, towards heaven. That's our direction. That's where we're headed. But the person without God The person who doesn't consider God, they're aimless, they're directionless. This is what we see with Cain. And not only that, but he was away from the presence of God. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16, it literally says that Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. This is not where we want to be. But when we find ourselves walking in the way of Cain, this is exactly where we will find ourselves, away from the presence of the Lord. And in terms of our eternity, this is the ultimate punishment. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul writes, In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Verse 
Walking in the way of Cain will lead us away from the presence of the Lord. Not just in this life, but in eternity. And finally, we see that when we walk in the way of Cain, it leads us somewhere, but it also leaves, it also leaves something behind, doesn't it? In this life. And for Cain, his actions, even after he was gone, left a corrupt example, a corrupt legacy, if you will, particularly to his descendants. Genesis chapter 23, or Genesis chapter 4, sorry, we're still in Genesis chapter 4 in verse 23. Lamech, who is a direct descendant of Cain, said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Cain's life became a twisted example of heroism for the wicked. That became a benchmark to be outdone by some, as we see here with Lamech. This, perhaps, was the greatest consequence of Cain's error. When we're dead and gone, when you're dead and gone, when I'm dead and gone, what will people think about you? Forget what they'll say. Seems like anybody finds honor on the day of their funeral these days. But what will they think? Will your actions become a benchmark to be outdone by the wicked? Will our actions be a reproach that rings out beyond your years on this earth? I was just talking recently to someone as a situation came up, and it prompted me to say, it prompted me to think that it's a very scary thought. To think that your actions, to think that our actions could bring reproach upon the church long after we're gone. That's a scary thought. And I know that Cain's actions didn't bring reproach on the church as it wasn't established yet. But you understand why I'm making the point. That's a scary thought. We see Cain's life still stands as an example of what not to do even for us today, thousands of years later. That's where walking in the way of Cain will lead us. Those who walk in the way of Cain, that Jude mentions in verses really 3 through 11, are people who hand themselves over to their lusts. In fact, their lusts are what drive them. When they are rebuked, when they hear sound wisdom, when they see all the warning lights, they ignore them all. And they proceed to fulfill their own agenda. They are without God. They are without direction. And their lives serve as an, as an example of corruption for the wicked to follow. But also an example of what not to do for those who are seeking heaven and seeking to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to us, the saints. So if you're here this evening and you feel that you are walking in the way of Cain, you have a spiritual struggle in your life and you want to come forward and, and confess a sin, or if you even want to talk to us privately afterwards, um, don't hesitate to approach if you understand the gospel and you feel that you're ready to be baptized, then we can do that as well at this time. If you come forward and uh, while we stand the song, of, while we stand and sing the song of invitation.